You don't want to live for me. You want to live for yourself. That's fine. I've got someone else. And that's what he was saying to Samuel. Don't grieve. Don't grieve over the king that I decided is not a good candidate. I've got someone else. God's always got someone else. And he's always looking at their heart, their motivations, their intentions, how they treat other people. And he knows automatically, if I exalt you, if I put you in a, a position of influence where you could make a large impact, are you going to let it get to your head? He already knows who's going to become prideful and high-minded and haughty and arrogant versus somebody who will say when they feel like that is starting to be the case, Lord, humble me. Don't, don't ever let me take the glory for myself. God, humble me. Remind me of where I came from. Remind me that I'm weak and flawed and made from the dust. If that's what it takes. He knows their heart. God is going to raise up some people. Some very unlikely candidates. That don't look like the ideal selection on paper. Maybe they don't have a college degree yet. Maybe they aren't well versed. Maybe they have a stutter. Maybe they don't have incredibly incredible communication or oratory skills, but he knows their hearts. Hallelujah. God responds, don't look on his appearance or the height of his stature because I have rejected him. The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Samuel says later on in the conversation, after multiple denials. So as each of Jesse's sons as being presented, the Lord is saying, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Neither has the Lord chosen this one. The Lord has not chosen these. Now Samuel notices we're getting down to the end and nobody has yet been selected. So the next logical question is, are all your sons here? And he's told there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. He is keeping the sheep. He wasn't even invited to the sacrifice. Apparently nobody thought that he was king material. Nobody thought he would even be considered for the job. And so they left him behind. He is keeping the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him. For we will not sit down until he comes here. We will not sit down until he comes here. And, and he sent and brought him in. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. So then Samuel took the horn of oil and he anointed the one who was feeding the sheep. The one who wasn't invited to the sacrifice. The one who was considered an outcast. The one who was disregarded. The one that was forgotten about. The one that nobody thought fit the bill. And he anointed him in the midst of his brothers. Can you imagine? But that's exactly what God does. God's word says he prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. In other words, God is going to raise you up in front of your naysayers. 
God is going to raise you up in front of the people who doubted you. God is going to raise you up in front of the people that mocked you. God is going to raise you up in front of them. He's going to anoint you in their presence. And at that moment, the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Now, here's the amazing part. The next thing that happens will blow your mind. David's been anointed king. He doesn't feel like a king. He doesn't look like a king. He doesn't walk like a king. He doesn't act like a king. But God said he will be a king. So you would think he would immediately go to the palace, right? And rule and reign and govern over the people. But that's not what God does. God is purposeful. He wants to make sure that before I put you in this position, that you have been properly prepared. So he sends him back to the sheep. A future king. God has declared, you will be king. But he sends them, he sends him back to the sheep. And what ends up happening is now King Saul, who's been rejected, but still in power, the spirit of the Lord has departed from him. And a harmful spirit is now tormenting him. A harmful spirit that I need to point out came from God. And his servants say to him, let us get you someone that's skillful on the leer. And when the harmful spirit is upon you, he will play it and you will be well. He will play it and you will be well. I want you to pay close attention to this for a minute because I'm going to reveal something to you. When you are being tormented, when you know that the enemy is coming up against you, when Satan, when the devil is attacking your mind, your thoughts, your dreams. The best way that you can start to attack him is worship. Worship. And that's basically what's happening here. They're playing music for the Lord and the tormenting spirit goes away. When you are being attacked, Play music for the Lord, sing to the Lord, and watch how fast the devil flees. He does not want to stick around for your praise for the Lord. Because the whole reason why the devil, why iniquity was found in him, is not just because of pride, but because he wanted the worship that was meant for God and God alone. So he doesn't want to listen to you praise the God that he got kicked out of heaven for. He doesn't want, he doesn't want to hear it. So please make that a part of you putting on your armor of God every day. Make sure you remind yourself that you are saved, that you are redeemed, that you are a child, a son or daughter of the most high God. Make sure you stay faithful. Make sure you use the sword of the spirit, the holy scripture, the word of God as your greatest defense, your, your best weapon, okay? And then finally, worship. It's not a request, it's a command. And there's a reason for this. Back to the story. So he will play it. And whenever he plays the music, you will be well. And every single time he played the music, the tormenting spirit that was sent by God left Saul, departed from him. Was it permanently? No, it was only temporary. So David is the one who is selected to play the lyre for Saul. I want you to follow me for a minute. David has been anointed future king, but he hasn't been eligible.